What what do you need? Oh, the bottom one too? Back up. I got a cable. I usually never bring my backpack and I brought my backpack. Yeah, Rob. You ball on Friday? How'd it go? Hmm? Oh, you did? Wow. No, no, no. Not yet. I, I came back really early, actually. I thought about it. I came back really early. I thought about it. It was like the first time I played with Sheikh Omar and those guys it was like nine months after my surgery. That's really early. I know, it was, it was like, it was actually irresponsible. We still won though. That's all that matters. Huh? <laughs> and I have, someone sent me video of it. That's the worst part. Is it started or no? It's not on? It's going? Okay. All right. Okay. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Welcome home, everybody. It's good to see you, alhamdulillah. Sorry, let me just close all these. I got my notes up. Alhamdulillah. Um, I wanted to share with you guys something that I, I read. You know, sometimes like you read something and then um, you see it somewhere and then like somebody calls you and then they tell you that they heard something like, you know, sometimes something happens over and over and over again. And you wonder, is it like, is it just me that I'm, uh, you know, coincidentally running into this information time and time again? Or is there something here? Is it something that's like more common and more popular? Or is this something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, is trying to tell me? So I was reading something uh, the other day in, in, in one of the books that I was preparing for class from. And then today I was watching on Instagram and I saw that uh, Sheikh Yahya wrote us, it was made a video talking about this very same thing. And then my, my mom in a text message sent me something very, very similar. And that was the question that a lot of people have when it comes to the, the issue of being tested. And Ibn Abbas, who is one of the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu one of his relatives, right, he's his cousin. Ibn Abbas, uh, عنه, he has 
an interesting statement. And Ibn Abbas is like one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu that was especially knowledgeable, that was especially uh, intelligent and had very, very deep understanding of the religion. And so if you read anything from Ibn Abbas or you know Ibn Mas'ud or Ibn Umar, uh, عنهم, you, you know that these were young people, young men that spent their time learning in the shade in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu And so their, their knowledge has been certified by the Prophet Sallallahu So he said that tests in life, when Allah Ta'ala sends you a test, uh, it can be one of three things. So this is a question that after every hard work, because we're talking about tests and trials in this book, people ask, like, what is the purpose of it? Or how do I know? Like, how to interpret it? How do I process it? So tests, he says, can be one of three things. He says, number one, is that a test can be a punishment. It can be a punishment. Uh, number two, he says, a test can be an atonement. Atonement means something that it comes and it takes away from another sort of punishment that you would have had. It atones for a mistake or a sin. So the test can be a punishment, number one. Number two, it can be something that atones, that it clears up your record. Or the third is that the test can be something that Allah sent your way so that by the test you will have gone closer to Allah. So it's not a punishment necessarily. It's not that you are atoning for some sin necessarily, but perhaps Allah put this test in your life so that at the end of it, you'll be closer to Allah than you thought. And so someone, you know, they ask, like, how do we know? You know, these are three options, but there's no real way for us to know whether it's a punishment or an atonement or bringing us near to Allah. And so uh, the scholars, Ibn Qayyim, one of them, he said particularly that you know what this is you know the purpose of it by the reaction that you give it. So they said that if you are frustrated and angry and you, are, uh, you respond in a way that it goes against Islam, like let's say, for example, Allah puts a test in your life and you just don't pray that day. You're like, whatever. I didn't get what I wanted. I don't, want to pr- I don't feel like praying. Then that, in fact, was a punishment. And the way that the scholars say that is that Allah Ta'ala would never ever send something to somebody that was good for them and their reaction would be like that. So if the person experiences a test and they fail, right, that test so to speak, then that was a punishment. And we ask Allah to protect us from that. The second is that if a person is tested and they're patient with it, like it's it's not nice, it's not sweet, it's not fun, but... They're patient and they bear with it and they handle it and then they make their way through it and they see themselves through the other side of it. Then that's what the scholars say is an atonement for them. It, it did kafara, it, 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 uh, it wiped away their sins. And so they should say alhamdulillah. And then he said, the third is that if a person gets a test and even in the test they feel this contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like they don't feel upset with Allah and they don't even necessarily feel like annoyed by it. They just say Alhamdulillah and they feel content. Which is, you know, those videos that we're seeing from Gaza, that Alhamdulillah. And that's, by the way, one of the ways I get a lot of messages about Gaza, people saying like, how is it the case that they could be crying, shedding tears and saying Alhamdulillah. People are like, there's a confusion there. Emotionally, that feels like it's, it's, it's on two different sides of the emotional spectrum. But you're, you're looking at emotions and then you're looking at spirituality. And those are two different things. Like a person can cry from sadness but still be happy with Allah. It's entirely possible. A person can be shedding tears because they hate the situation that's in front of them. But they can still in their heart love the one who put them in that situation. It's possible. And so as people are, are experiencing these tragedies... But they're still saying things like Alhamdulillah, Raditu Billah, you know, I'm pleased with Allah, Raditu Billahi Rabba, I'm happy that Allah is my Lord, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. 
inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah's name is constantly rolling off their tongue. What you're seeing is the highest level of a person passing their test, and that is that with every difficulty that Allah puts in front of them, they're just getting closer and closer and closer to Him. And then Ibn Abbas, he finishes with like the, the grand finale. You know what he says? He says, and what's beautiful about all of these is that every single one of them is good for the believer. Every single one. So number one, let's go, let's go to the best one. If you get close to Allah, of course, that's great. Like who wouldn't like to end up closer to Allah? You get tested and then you end up having higher, you know, stronger faith, higher trust in Allah. That's good. Number two, you get tested and then you're atoning for it. You're patient. Who wouldn't want that? Becoming someone that has more sabr, right? In Allah Allah is with those who are patient. Who wouldn't want to be more patient? But what about the first one? Or the last one, I guess, so to speak. What about the one that it's a punishment and that the consequences, they prove that this person is experiencing some sort of punishment? Why? Why would that be good for even the believer? Ibn Abbas. This is why these people are so smart. You know what he said? Who can guess? Anyone guess? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Maybe. Okay, that's a good, that's a really good, that, I like your positivity. Right? She said, maybe like at the end of it, you change your ways. You know, you have that moment, you make that mistake, you go far from Allah, and then you turn around. You make that U-turn, you say, you know, what? I'm coming back to Allah. Inshallah. But then that would be atonement. Right? Or that might actually be, subhanAllah, qurba. You might actually get closer to Allah. But you know why he said that even the punishment is good? He said, because at least it's here and it's not in the akhirah. He said, at least you're going to, look, if you have to choose one, if it's going to be punishment either way and you have to pick one, I think 10 times out of 10, everybody would pick having their punishment here instead of the akhirah. Of course, we don't ask for punishment. Nobody try to be the hero, okay? One of the companions tried this. One of the companions made dua that Allah expiate their sins and, and, and uh, free them from their accountability in this life instead of the next life. And then he fell deathly ill and the Prophet ﷺ came to see him and said, what did you do? And he said, I prayed for this. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, you ask Allah for afiyah. You ask him for well-being and pardoning. Don't try to be the hero. Don't say, oh Allah, give me my punishment here. Don't say, say oh Allah, give me no punishment anywhere. Because you know why? Allah can do that and he will do that. There's no, no, you don't have to try to be strong in front of Allah. That's not how that works. Okay? So the reason why I shared that with you is because, again, this entire series is about finding meaning in trial. And Ibn Abbas, you know, was right there telling us, here are the meanings that you can extrapolate, right? Some of the meanings. So we started uh, last Monday, we started with our series or the, the, the session on forgiveness. And he says in the text, he says that the benefit that you get in trials, one of the benefits is al-afu'an janiha. He says that you are given the possibility and the chance to forgive somebody. And we told the story of Amr bin al-As, who was the companion who accepted Islam very, very late in the grand scheme of things, right? Amr bin al-As accepted Islam very late, just a couple of years before the passing of the Prophet Wasallam, And he spent his in whole he spent the whole time of messengership of the Prophet ﷺ fighting against him. In every, in every situation he could, he tried to fight against him. And even up until the very end of his, of his ignorance, he still tried to cause pain to the Prophet ﷺ until the Najashi, the Abyssinian king, told him what? He, he basically he socked him, he punched him and said, go and you need to go and meet the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. He goes to Medina Right outside of Medina, he meets with Khalid ibn al-Walid. Uh, and they're both going now to meet the Prophet ﷺ and to finally hear him and take, his, his, take uh, allegiance with Islam. And they go and Amr very famously, he pulls his hand away right when they're about to do the shahada. And he pulls his hand and the Prophet ﷺ says, why did you do that? And he says, O Messenger of Allah, will Allah forgive me for everything I've done? Everything? 
right? Forgiveness for the one. And he's looking. Remember what he said in the hadith? I couldn't even look at him in the face. Amr said I couldn't even look at him because I was so ashamed. The last 20 years I spent trying to kill this man. And now I'm sitting in front of him. And I'm holding his hand in my hand. And me, even a few days ago, I would have taken his hand and I would have tried to kill him again. But now I'm sitting here and I'm shaking his hand, bearing witness that he's the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa And so he asked the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I've done so many horrible things. Will Allah forgive me? Will Allah forgive me? And he's asking the one that he committed crimes against, Will Allah forgive me? Will I be forgiven? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells him, What? You will be just like the day you were born. Nothing on your record. No sin on your record at all. And he takes the shahada with the Prophet sallallahu So we mentioned that story. Why? Because the hadith that was narrated about having mercy was narrated not by Amr but by his son. And so Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he narrated about this hadith and it's coming from who? From his father who is talking about forgiveness and his father experienced this firsthand. Okay? And so al Ibn Abdul Salam, he says that if you want to be forgiving, if you want to be in the seat and the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ in that moment, if you want to copy his example, you can't expect to be able to have that moment if you think that everybody just has to treat you right all the time. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ is dealing with somebody who for 20 years didn't just talk about him, didn't just say nasty things, but literally tried to kill him. And in trying to kill him, was unsuccessful and showed no remorse until the very end. You know, even if somebody comes to us right now after 20 years of hurting us and shows remorse, what do we say? I mean, everybody has their moment, right? Everybody's like, you know what? I'm going to forgive you, but first, I'm going to let you have it. And you tell them, oh, now you're coming. Oh, now? You think it's a good time now? Now that we've opened Mecca? Now that we're in charge? Okay, all right, um, let's see. Let's go over all the last two decades, how you hurt me. And you know what? If the Prophet ﷺ did that, he would have been right. And in that session in Sirah, for years to come, for thousands of years to come, when it was that session, all of us would have been yelling takbir. We would have been so happy because that's who we are. That's who we are. If the Prophet ﷺ said, yeah, um, and he just holds him up and slaps him and says, every time, you did this to me. You were in the battle that killed my uncle. And just beat on him. We would have been like, hmm, mess with us one more time, right? You know what I mean? Like, but subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he takes his hand gently, like he's holding a, like he's holding a baby bird, like takes it so gently and says, SubhanAllah. And that, I'll tell you, man, that's the transformation that, that we're thinking about when we think about what we want to become. Al Afu an Janiha, the one who has committed the crime. Then he quotes, Allah says, Wal'afina an nas, the one who forgives people. Feman afa wa aslaha fa ajruhu ala Allah. Allah says in the Quran, whoever forgives wa aslaha and then tries to rebuild. Because it's possible to, to, to forgive and not rebuild. You can forgive somebody and then you can constantly remind them, hey, you messed up. You're the worst. I forgave you, but you're not worth it. Right? I'm hoping uh, some people are nodding. Like their childhood was full of this. I'm sorry, right? But this is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not to keep bringing something. And we're going to go over the steps how to achieve this. It's not to keep bringing it up because Allah says, whoever forgives and pardons, well, aslaha, and then overlooks and rectifies and tries to build, fa'ajruhu ala Allah. This is like, Allah says their reward cannot be measured. It's like when you go out to dinner with somebody and they're like, order whatever you want. What do you do? You're like, okay, I know what I want, but what does my mom at home want? Right? What do my friends want? Like, what, how, can I, how can I make the most of the situation, right? So when Allah says, فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى Allah," He's saying you can't even measure it. Only Allah knows what's in store for the person who forgives. And then he says, He said, and the greater, the greatest level of forgiveness is indicative of the greatest ability to pardon. It's the best way to forgive. It's the best way to forgive. Now I want to read you some of the benefits and thinking about how to react when somebody wrongs you. 
And we'll talk about it, by the way. Because is there, let me ask you guys a question. Is there a place in our faith that teaches us that you don't necessarily have to forgive? Is there a place in which Islam teaches us that you don't have to give up your right? You can claim your right. You can seek punishment for the person. Is there? We'll talk about that. Okay, you're getting a little too excited. Everyone's like, yes. We'll get a little bit too excited. But no, in, in reality, look, when you look at Gaza, when you look at the situation, like, to be honest with you, you're kind of like, I don't want to forgive. I want justice. I'm not going to overlook this. Right? If they stopped bombing today and said, we're done. Let's go back to Tel Aviv. You'd be like, no, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Right? We got to start up the hay. We got to have some criminal, international criminal cases. So what then is the line between when it's virtuous to forgive and virtuous to hold people accountable? That's actually taught to us in our religion. But let's talk about the default. Because a lot of times we like to jump into the concessions. Right? Punish, punish, punish. But let's talk about the default. The default is forgiveness. The default is forgiveness. What is this talking about? So when someone bumps into you, when someone owes you a few bucks, when someone might have forgotten to say salam, you know, just those little small inconveniences. And we'll talk, I'm going to use this phrase a lot. You ready? Functional versus dysfunctional. Does the person wronging you dysfunctionalize your life? Have they taken something from you that has derailed you? Or is it a level of wrong where even you will forget about it very shortly after that? That's the line, by the way. And so for everything that is considered a functional wrong, when somebody wrongs you, but it's just something that you can move on with, you can continue on, right? There's a couple of ways that you can convince yourself to move on with it and not to hold on. Number one, has anyone in here been wronged before? Raise your hand if you've ever been wronged. If someone's wronged you, they've hurt you, and, and you, you were in a position where you should have been given justice. Raise your hand. Raise it high. Don't be scared. You weren't scared when you subtweeted. Raise it high. Okay, so, yes. And the reality is, like, look, if you are alive, if you lived, if you have a heartbeat, you've been wronged. It's a reality, okay? You know how I know that? Because the Prophet ﷺ was wronged, and who here is better than him? That's the first thing. You, you walk around the world, and you expect nobody to wrong you, and then you read the seerah, and you're like, who am I? Why did I expect that? I'm so silly to assume that I'm so special that if he, the best of all of creation, he could have never treat. you want to hear something? He could have never treated people better. Allah described him. You were the best in character. He couldn't have treated people better. The only time that we have a moment in which Allah, and I, don't, I want to use this word very carefully. I'm going to use, I'm, for everyone who's listening to the podcast, I'm using air quotes. I'm looking at the camera directly. The only time that Allah, I don't even want to say it, t- taught him, not, I don't want to say corrected because that's not, taught him was with Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma. When this man, this sahabi, came to him, he was a blind man, and he interrupted the Prophet ﷺ. And he interrupted him when he was having a very serious conversation. Now, in that moment, the decision that the Prophet ﷺ made was that I'm in the middle of this, and this is going to give safety and prosperity and, and, you know, to the Muslims in Mecca, if I can convince these guys to either become Muslim or be okay with us as Muslims, we're going to be good. Like, we don't have to worry about it anymore. No more harassment, no more torture, no more killing. And Abdullah bin Umaktoum, who is a Muslim, he goes to the Prophet Wasallam, and the, the narration says he asked him a question that didn't look like it had much seriousness. It wasn't as critical. Okay, it's like someone's dealing with a very serious issue and they're talking to somebody about something life or death and then somebody comes up and asks, what's the ruling on wiping over these socks? It's not that it's not from Islam, of course, wiping over socks, right? It's part of wudu, it's a question. Okay, sure, but is that the time? Is that the place? Now, here's the issue. The man asking is blind. He's unaware necessarily of the seriousness of the situation, but he's also somebody that 
according to the, the culture in Quraysh, was not esteemed, was not looked at, was not revered. And so in that moment, the Prophet Sallallahu the tafsir said, his eyebrow, I want you to understand something. The translation was pretty bad. Abasa wa tawalla, that he frowned and turned away. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't frown like some cartoon character. Right? Some anime character whose mouth just goes upside down. No, the Prophet Sallallahu the tafsir said, his eyebrow twitched. You just did it. He just twitched, right? The girl was like, a little twitch. Couldn't even notice it. Like, Now here's the craziest part. Allah memorialized that moment of his eyebrow twitching, which most people wouldn't have been able to notice, even if they were staring at him. So they would have thought that it was anything. Maybe his, his forehead was itching. Maybe a bug flew. Who knows? But Allah memorialized it in front of a person who couldn't have even seen it because he was blind. And Allah memorialized that moment. And for the rest of his life, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, number one, the Prophet ﷺ made him like the governor of Medina, basically. He said, this guy's in charge. When I'm gone, he's in charge. He made him the mu'adhin. You know what's amazing about that? What skill do you have to have as a mu'adhin? Your voice, that's true. Good one, right? But actually, you can just kind of be like, sort of like mid with it if you want, I guess. There's no requirement for beautiful voice, right? There, there is none. But what do you have to know in order to call the adhan? The time for prayer. And how do Muslims know what time to pray? Your phone. Exactly. No. <laughs> how do you know 1,400 years ago? The sun. What do you need in order to identify the position of the sun? Your sight. The man that the Prophet Sallallahu appointed to be the mu'adhin could not do the very first requirement in the job. And the Prophet Sallallahu knew that. So then the companions, like one time they asked, like, you sure? And he's like, I'm sure. You guys will see the sun and you will tell him. He's basically the, the backup masjid uh, uh, you know, administrator. He handles everything. If Bilal's not there, Abdullah ibn Maktoum is going to give the adhan. Right? Why am I telling you this story? Because this story is the only story that we have where the Prophet Sallallahu hypothetically could have done something different. But he didn't and Allah used that moment to teach us. And so if I expect, how much, have we ever done worse to somebody in our life than that? Have we ever had worse than a twitch of the eyebrow when someone interrupted us? Yes. So we can't expect people to treat us perfectly. Okay? So the first thing you have to do when you get upset that somebody wronged you is you have to remember, number one, that you've been wronged. Now, when someone wrongs you, you have to transport yourself where? Transport yourself to become the person that wronged somebody. Have you guys ever hurt somebody's feelings before? You guys ever wronged somebody before? Yes or no? Yeah. When you wrong somebody and you want their forgiveness, how bad do you feel? How bad do you feel? You feel miserable. You can't even look at them in the face. You're not hungry. You have a headache. You're always tired. Right? If you're really going at it with somebody and you know you're wrong and they're not forgiving you, how do you feel? You feel completely unlike yourself. You don't even want to be, you just put down your phone, you just sit, time is just going by, you feel out of it. What would you give in that moment where you were desperately seeking forgiveness? What would you give for the person that you wronged to just call you and say, hey, you know what? Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. It's water under the bridge. We, don't worry about it. Come over. Let's, have, let's go get some food. What would you give? You would give so much. You would do so much for that. So the scholars say, when somebody wrongs you, just flip the positions, put yourself in their shoes, and think to yourself that when I've wronged somebody before, I've desperately wanted their forgiveness. How then can I sit here so high, so mighty, and strangle this person emotionally and say, you know what? No. I'm going to make you suffer. I'm going to make you feel the pain. I'm going to hurt you. Because you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. And this is what al ibn Abdul Salam is saying. If you, if you really revel and savor making someone feel this way, you're missing out on the gem of what this test is bringing right to your doorstep. How incredible do you feel when you forgive somebody? How much of a absolute like strength in your iman just shoots up 
and you realize I'm not a slave to my nefs anymore because my nefs wanted me to blast this person. And now in this scenario, I'm just, I'm above that. I'm above that. So number one, they say, think of the times in which you wanted others to desperately forgive you and put yourself in that person's place. Okay. Number two, develop empathy for this person. This is what happens when you forgive. You start to develop empathy. There's a statement by Bakr ibn Abdullah al-Muzani, who's a scholar. And he says, it's actually very interesting. He says, and I do this, by the way. When I read this statement, I was like, wow, that's crazy. I literally try to do this. You know, maybe you do too. He says that when a person wrongs you, he says, do not think of that person as so-and-so. He said their name. Don't think of the person that is their name. He goes, think of that person as someone's father, as someone's brother, as someone's child, or their mother, their sister, their daughter. He said, would you like it if someone didn't forgive your father? Do you guys ever feel good if someone comes up to you and says, man, I hate your dad? Seriously. Or man, I hate your brother. Or man, I hate your son. Could you imagine? The rage you would feel if somebody came up to you and said about your family, I just hate your mom, man. I hate your daughter. So annoying. Could you imagine that? I swear, if someone did that, don't test me, please. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and you would too. How would you respond? And so subhanAllah, Bakr bin Abdullah al-Muzani, he says, look, that person that you're hating on is someone's father. There's someone's brother. There's someone's sister. There's someone's daughter. There's someone to someone. And your rage is blinding you from seeing this. Your, your anger is stopping you from humanizing them. And in your lack of ability to humanize, you're becoming a monster and all you can see is anger. And so forgiveness is the only way to fix that issue. Forgiveness is the only way to fix that. Number three, the scholars say, when you forgive the person that wronged you, you actually now have just opened up a new door. What door is this? Allah will forgive you. This is my favorite story. I've told it so many times, but I love it. Well, not my favorite, but one of them. Top 10 for sure. Top 20. I have a lot. Okay, so Abu Bakr, radiallahu an. His daughter is Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa radiallahu anha. And Abu Bakr is also, he has a nephew. The nephew's name is Mistah. Mistah ibn Uthatha. He's a companion, radiallahu anhu. He's one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. It's actually very interesting. And this is a very human story. So, Mustah, in, in one day, is sitting with his, his mom, Um Mustah, creative. So, they're sitting there and they're talking about something, some gossip, some juicy stuff, spilling tea everywhere. But unfortunately, unfortunately, that gossip is about none other than his cousin, the daughter of Abu Bakr, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. What was this gossip, this rumor, this slander that was made against her? The slander was that uh, it's called hadith of, the Hadith of Ifk. The slander was that one of the hypocrites in Medina uh, took an opportunity when Sayyidah Aisha was caught back on an expedition and she came after the expedition had arrived, this, 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 this horrible person, this munafiq, made up this lie about her that she was not faithful to the Prophet And I'm going to stop describing it there, that she was not faithful. So this rumor, this slander, this lie, actually, believe it or not, let me ask you guys first this question, right? You guys ever seen something like this before? You guys ever been like the, the victim of a lie? Someone lied about you before? Do you know I got expelled from Islamic school because of a lie? Isn't that crazy? They never caught the stuff I actually did. <laughs> that, <laughs> but, but someone actually made up something about me. And it's crazy, actually, subhanAllah. And they actually expelled me because of that. I'll never forget. And it, the only person who believed that I didn't do the thing that was said about me uh, was my Quran teacher, Ms. Mahari. And she said, her, her proof was very interesting. She said that 
I've taught him Quran for three years. And she goes, like when you teach someone Quran, you know their heart. And she goes, I'm telling you, by the way that I've taught him Quran, by the way that we, because we, she used to teach me, Syrian, Syrian auntie, man, mashallah. She said, I guarantee you he did not do what you just said he did. I, I, can, I can take an oath by Allah that he didn't do it. And that was so emotional for me because as a kid, I was like, dang, like low key, I could have done what she said that I did, but <laughs> she knows. And I thought that was some sort of superpower because she was like, and subhanAllah, and anyways, that, she was the only person that other people didn't believe me. Uh, I think the kid who made up the lie was the son of a donor, but next, uh, next, next, next part of the story. So I got expelled, right? So the reason, why, the reason why I'm sharing that is not because I'm therapizing right now, even though I clearly am. It's because lies have real life implications. I got kicked out of the school. I couldn't go back. I had, you know, from there I had to go to public school. It was February. Just hop into public school in February. New kid, right? Got to figure out classes. Got to figure out this and that. And and it was very very difficult. And my mother was very hurt. And the rumors in the community spread and all this stuff, right? And it was not true. And alhamdulillah. You know, things are what they are. What's interesting is that 10 years later when I graduated and started Roots and started teaching, they invited me back to be the distinguished guest of honor <laughs> to speak at the alumni dinner. And the funny thing is, I was like, I, I, I went, of course, I accepted it. Are you think I'm ever going to turn on that opportunity to be petty? So then I go <laughs> and I stand on the mic in front of everybody and I say, Salaam alaikum, and they're like, oh, this is Abdurrahman Murphy from Dallas. I go, actually from Chicago. And I go, I was born and raised in Chicago. I went to this school, and I said, and I'm not an alum. Because technically, in order to be an alum, you have had to graduate. And I unfortunately was not given the chance to graduate from this school. And Miss Mahari was in the audience, and I told the story about her believing in me and this and that. And she started crying. It was amazing. Anyways, but real life implications, man. My mom stressed out, my family, like having to, you know, people, why, why is he not in the school anymore, this and this? That's me. That's a nobody. That's nothing. Can you imagine the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Can you imagine the things that people were saying? Can you imagine how she felt? One of the narrations said that she actually developed a fever. She got physically sick because of the pressure of this slander that was made about her. The Prophet Sallallahu himself didn't even know what to believe. It was a very real scenario. I mean, everyone here was like, what, what, huh? Why wouldn't Allah just give them the answer right away and save them from this test? <laughs> That's the thing. These tests come to everybody. You can't assume that for some reason you're immune. Allah could have given them the answer right away. Abdullah bin Ubayyah is like, huh, where was she? And Allah could have just sent revelation. She was faithful. She was fine. He could have said that. The munafiq has lied. Literally, Allah could have said that. Done. Game over. End of story. That's a question we have, right? Why does Allah let these things happen? Why does he let them develop? Well, now, 1,400 years later, we're sitting here talking about this story, and we understand the damage of slander. We understand the resilience of Aisha, radiallahu anha. We understand the strength of their faith, and we can learn from this. And now, when any one of us is slandered, we look at our mother, Aisha, and we say, it's okay, I'm in good company. I'm with her. And Allah himself, when he exonerated her, Aisha radiallahu anha, she's so funny. And you read her narration, she's very sarcastic. She said that, Alhamdulillah, in a time when nobody could quite believe that I didn't do this, Allah himself exonerated me. I'm good. You know what I mean? Like she had that level of connection now with Allah. Amazing. So, Abu Bakr, her father, hears about this lie hears that somebody said this about his daughter, his baby girl. And unfortunately, the person he hears it from is her cousin. Her cousin is the person that is... Now, he's not doing this on purpose. He's not like trying to make a big deal out. He's just, you know, people get bored. They don't know what to talk about. Their lives are boring. Not him. You know, he's a Sahabi. I'm not saying about him. But in general, you know us, like humans, we're like sitting there, we're like... So what else is new? That's when you know conversations are going to go south fast. Six minutes in, the chips are finished, there's only salsa left. What else is going on? How's the weather? Oh, we already talked about that. Hey, do you know, did you see so-and-so's Instagram? That's when it starts to get serious. 
So Mustah is just kind of telling the story about his cousin and what's oh it's so did you hear so and so said this? Did you hear that about Aisha? Oh my goodness. Wow, that's crazy. That's that's where you know people are like, that's crazy. And Abu Bakr hears about this. Now here's the challenge. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he actually he gives Mistah money every week, every month. He he's a, he gives him a stipend. He takes care of him. Can you imagine after giving this guy money, taking care of his life, making sure that he has food on the table, a place to live, income. Now you find out that he's talking poorly about your daughter or he didn't come defend her. Like at the very minimum, if I'm paying somebody and that person hears a rumor about my kid, I don't care if they believe it or not. They'd be like, "Uh uh-uh, not the daughter of the guy who pays me. I mean, not my cousin, you know, like. That's what, it, that's what we all would expect. And Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, he expected that too. And when he found out that Mustah didn't do that, he got frustrated. And he said to him, you're done. You're cut off. No more money from me. You treat family like that? You didn't defend your cousin? You didn't defend my daughter? You're not getting a penny from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse. Again, look inside your nafs right now. What does your nafs want the verse to say? <laughs> your nephew wants the verse to say like, good job, <laughs> right? Leave the haters behind. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Like that's what you're waiting for. Like Abu Bakr's praise. Allah praises Abu Bakr for leaving Mustah behind. Yes, let people taste the pain of their own bad choices. That doesn't sound like the Quran. Allah Ta'ala, he says to Abu Bakr Siddiq, he says to him, Right through the Quran, he's he's talking about this moment. That he says, forgive and overlook. Pardon and overlook. Wouldn't you love that Allah forgives you? When Abu Bakr heard this hadith, uh, this this uh, revelation, he said, hold on. He forgot about the thing that happened. And he said, hold on. If I forgive him, then Allah will forgive me? And he was, yes. He said, okay, you're forgiven. So the scholars say that the third way to develop forgiveness for somebody is to realize that if you don't forgive them, what are you leaving on the table? If you forgive them. Now, now here's the crazy part. Allah did not say anything about mistah. He didn't say that he was confused. He didn't mean it. This and this. He didn't say any of that. All he said was, look, you are going to be wronged. That is a truth. You're going to be wronged by people that have no excuse. If in that scenario, you have the courage and the strength to forgive them, despite the fact that they have given you no reason to forgive them. If you do that, you will have displayed such a beautiful character that Allah says, I will forgive you on the day of judgment. Because you have had no right to sin against me either, Allah says. You had no excuse either. So if you show forgiveness to somebody that had no excuse, then I will show you forgiveness when you have no excuse. That's it. So now all of a sudden, when you start to add these things up, you're like, hold on. I need to be a lot more forgiving. <laughs> If I forgive people, then Allah will forgive me on the day of judgment. Wallahi, you won't even remember that people have wronged you. You won't even remember it. All you're going to be worried about is yourself. The only thing you're going to be thinking about is that you wrong people. And then if you have the courage to forgive in this life, Allah will erase the mistakes that you made. He will forgive you when you need it most. Okay? Number four, when you forgive... Try not to hold it over somebody. Try not to remind them. Don't bring it up because that's not forgiveness. See, forgiveness has one important quality, and that is generosity. Generally speaking, people who are generous are also very forgiving. Generally speaking, those qualities, they work together. And part of the generosity of forgiveness, it's not financial. Part of the generosity of forgiveness is that when you forgive somebody, you don't mention it. You don't talk about it. You know, in the battle that we talked about, the Prophet ﷺ, in the battle of Uhud, 
when the archers that he told to stay on the mountain when they left and they didn't listen to him. Right? If you've been for Umrah, inshallah, you, you'll be able to visit this place, the mountain of Uhud, and you'll be able to see exactly where the battle happened, where the archers didn't leave. The, I've told the story so many times, so I'm not going to tell it again, but at the end of the story, after the Muslims had suffered the ending, the outcome that they had suffered in that battle, you know what's so incredible, subhanAllah, is that the archers who were absolutely, if we were to look at the story objectively, the archers who were absolutely the ones at fault, when everything was said and done and the dust had settled and everything cleared, Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu that you need to forgive them. Wa'fu anhum. Forgive them. Wastaghfir lahum. And, O Messenger, pray to Allah that He forgives them too. Then He says, What? Washawirhum fil amr. This is the part that I want to focus on. We talked about forgiveness a lot. But after you forgive, you can't ice people. If you forgive somebody and then you make them feel like you still hate them, like they're still invisible to you then you haven't really forgiven them. Because according to Allah, true forgiveness is when you what? When you bring somebody back in. Because Allah says, وَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And bring them back in. Literally, the ayah translates to what? Seek their feedback in the situations that you're talking about in the community. Because what do you think is going to happen, guys, when the archers who lost the battle, who made it such... Go back to Medina. And everyone is mourning the loss of their uh, 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 martyred relatives and friends. Who is everyone going to look at as being the fault, the problem, the reason why we lost? Who? The archers. And it's very, very easy for when somebody makes a mistake for everyone to gang up on them and to kick them out. But you know who wins when we gang up on people and push them out? You know who wins? Shaitan. Because that's when shaitan comes. And by the way, there was a companion. There was a companion in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, who made a big mistake. He deserted and he left the army when they were going on an expedition. And as a result, as a punishment for his desertion, he was given a period of silence. You got to go and you got to be under house arrest, man. Stay in your house. We got to wait and see what Allah is going to tell us about you. We don't know. Can we trust you? Like we have your back, but you didn't have our back. Can we trust you? So you know what? Until Allah sends us Quran on how to deal with you, because we don't know. You got to go wait in your house and you just got to stay there. No, no one can interact with you because we don't know if you're trustworthy or not. You know what happened when that, in that situation? A local Christian tribal leader started sending him letters. A local Christian king from the area, from, from the, the Central Asian, uh, Arabian area. Say, hey, why don't you come join us? Look at how your messenger is treating you. Right? Why don't you come join Well, we would never treat you that way. Right? So shaitan, he loves when people get isolated and iced and kicked out. He loves that. Because the wolf always attacks the lone sheep. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom said, when somebody commits a wrong, you can deal with it. You have to deal with it. That's fine. But you should never ever deal with it in a way that makes a person have to fend for themselves. Because the community is the right of everybody. And so he says, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فُلْ أَمْرِ Bring them back in. Now when he brings them back in, the Prophet ﷺ didn't bring them back in and say, alright guys, um, here's the archers. We all know. Right? Uh, the, they used to be the archers, but I don't know what they can be now. None of that. Another example of this. You ready? Who was one of the Prophet Sallallahu greatest enemies? Abu what? Abu Sufyan, but he, he became Muslim. Abu what? Jahl. All right, very good. Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl had a son. Abu Jahl's son, his name was Ikrima. Ikrima bin Abi Jahl. You know what we say about him? Radiallahu an. May Allah be pleased with him. You know what's crazy? When he accepts Islam and he's being brought to the Muslims. I want you guys to understand this. Guys, I'm not trying to make a joke or make anyone laugh. I want you to think about this in the same way that you would think about Ikrima. I want you to imagine that right now through those doors, Netanyahu's son walked in. 
just process this emotionally. What would you feel? Abu Jahl, right, did to the Prophet Sallallahu did to the Muslims what we're seeing. They used to, t- they used to spear, you know how, you know how Sumayya passed away? You know how they killed Sumayya radiallahu anha? They took a spear through her abdomen, through her genitals. They took a spear through her. This stuff's been happening to Muslims. This isn't, when you read the seerah, that's why the biggest thing you can do when you're trying to cope with what's happening in Gaza, on top of dua, donations, and advocating, protesting, posting, boycotting, all of this works. But you have to also learn the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because it will give you context. You'll start to understand, man, this has been this way since day one. Like, we've had to deal with this from day one. So, I want you to think about if Netanyahu's son just walked in this door right now. And then, I want you to imagine that you were told, don't say anything about his father. Don't. That's what happened with Ikrimah. <laughs> Ikrimah is coming back to accept Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ, before he arrives, imagine they're seeing him in the distance, he's coming. He looks at the companions around him, he goes, if I even hear one of you say anything about Abu Jahl, and then the Prophet, and they all looked, and the Prophet ﷺ says, why? Because your words, this is so powerful. He goes, the words of the living never reach the dead, they only hurt the living. So you, you're trying to hurt Abu Jahl, you're not trying to hurt Akrama. But by talking about his dad, you're only going to hurt who? Him, man. Even if he's Muslim, even if he disavows everything, that his dad did, even if he develops hatred for who his dad was, do you still think he wants to sleep at night knowing that that was his dad? Do you think he wants to sleep at night knowing that you guys are all thinking that about him? So, subhanAllah, when you forgive, you have to be forgiving in a generous way. You can't hold it over somebody. You can't make your forgiveness conditional. That's not forgiveness. That's torture. That's torture. And the Prophet ﷺ had every reason, had every reason to tell Ikrama when he showed up, curse your father right now in front of us. We're going to go to your dad's grave. I want you to go, and I want you to spit on your dad's grave. Prove that you're a Muslim. And again, the petty, nefsical people in us would have been like, Takbir, show him who's boss. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't do that. He said, welcome. Welcome, brother. Come on in. May Allah Ta'ala make us more like him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A couple more pieces. When you forgive, there's a statement of one of the scholars, Al-Khalil ibn Ahmed. And he actually gives a very interesting advice. When you get wronged. Okay, think about the time someone wronged you. He says, when you get wronged, إِذَا asaa or man asaa. فَأَحْسَنَ إِلَيْهِ If you are wronged, then to the person that wronged you, do good to them. If someone, you know, spits towards you, then give them a hug. If someone trashes you, buy them a gift. مَنْ أَسَاءَ فَأَحْسَنَ إِلَيْهِ Whoever wrongs you, do good to him. Why? He says, subhanAllah, as a reward, what will Allah give you? He says, حَصَلَ لَهُ حَاجِزٌ مِنْ قَلْبِهِ يُرِدْدِعُهُ عَنْ مِثْلِ أَسَائِتِهِ Which means, Allah will give you the, the, the gift that whatever that person did, like whatever that person wronged you with, Allah will protect your heart from ever doing that to anybody else. <laughs> Which, by the way, I was reading this with one of my friends, and he's a psychologist. And he goes, wow, that's really interesting because one of the greatest tools to stop somebody in their behavior is empathy. And he said, if somebody wrongs you, and instead of responding with evil, you do good to them, you'll always remember the pain of being wronged. And the moment you have a chance to wrong somebody in the same way, what are you going to think about? No, no, I can't do that. Because when so-and-so did it to me, it hurt me so badly, I would never want to do it to that person. But if you wrong them back, this is the crazy part. 
And my friend said this, my psychologist friend said this. He said, if you wrong somebody back, if they wrong you, you wrong them back, you know what you've lost in that whole thing? The lesson of how much it hurt to be wronged. You've lost it because now you're so focused on returning the pain. You haven't had time to understand that you're in pain. Now you just want to go back at that person. And if you go on in life, you haven't gained from that moment the empathy needed not to hurt other people. Because now it's what? One for one. Whoever hurts me, I hurt them back. The only way you can learn empathy through forgiveness is that when someone wrongs you, you forgive them and you do good back to them. Another beautiful uh, 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 statement. When you're wronged and someone hurts you and you can't get revenge or you're deciding like, should I get revenge or not? Okay, because many of us, we have the chance. You know, whether it's like a clap back or whether it's like something like really ignorant, may Allah protect us. Because sometimes you get the greatest ideas when you're angry, right? SubhanAllah. One time a person came to Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who was the Khalifa at the time, and he said to Umar, he said, somebody wronged me. Someone hurt me. They really did me dirty. And he says, and I want to get back at him so badly. Like I have the chance right now to just go and destroy this guy. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, don't do it. He said, why? He said, because if this person wronged you and you leave it be, and they don't make tawbah, right? They just, he says, you show up on the day of judgment and you have this giant ticket to Jannah. And on this ticket, it says, look what this person did to me. And I dealt with it patiently. He goes, however, if you engage in this battle and you wrong them back, you're taking that ticket and you're ripping it down the middle because you're giving up the justice that you deserve. And this is going to bring me to my final point now which is in the journey to forgive, there is a point. Because Muslims, we have rights. Everybody has rights. And forgiveness is the default. But there are exceptions in these moments. The exception in which every person has to make a choice, but the exception in which a person should make and prioritize their choice as being getting their right is when the oppression that you experienced physically, mentally, and spiritually ruins your ability to function. For example, if somebody came and took $1 from my wallet, first of all, who carries cash anymore? If somebody came and Vedmoed themselves $1 from my phone, okay, and I find out, it's like $1, I'm kind of like, okay, like that's fine, I guess. Right? I don't even think twice about it. I'm like, okay, no big deal. One dollar, whatever. But let's say that this same person came and I look at my bank account and there's $50,000 gone. First of all, I'm like, wait, how did they get what wasn't there? <laughs> they just overdrafted Venmo. <laughs> but let's say they say $50,000. Which one of these amounts causes me a, a, a dysfunction in my life? The fi okay, come on, everybody. I know you guys think well of me, but imams are not paid that well. Okay, which one of these causes dysfunction in my life? The 50, right? Now, the $1, I have the choice. Everything is my huck, by the way. I can go to that person and be, if I can take them to court. They stole $1 from me. They stole $1 from me. I could do that. In Islam, I'm allowed to do that. If anyone even takes one penny, you have your huck, and you can go, and you can seek your right. Absolutely, no doubt. But where then does the ethic of forgiving come in? The ethic of forgiving comes in in that you have to decide what's worth it. If you're constantly chasing every single right that people owe you, you will never experience the sweetness of forgiveness. Can you give up the dollar? See, many of us, we don't even necessarily experience like the $50,000 thing. But the $1 thing, we get so upset over it. Someone says something to us just like slightly off. Maybe they're having a bad day and they say something slightly off. Can we forgive in that moment? Or do we really have to just make them, let them know who's in charge or that they did us wrong? So the dysfunctionality is a big, big thing. But here's the crazy part. And we're going to conclude here. 
What was the last thing we talked about? The last gift of, for, of, of, of trials, right? Starts with H, ends with ilm. Helm. Hel means what? The ability to what? To forbear, to persevere, to deal with things, right? And we talked about it. People's ability to deal with things, there's lower amounts and there's higher amounts, correct? Yes or no? Yeah. And usually like as you get older, as you deal with life more, your ability to deal with things goes up or down. Usually goes up. You're able to handle more. You know, like when you're younger and you're a kid, you can't handle any disappointment. <laughs> this is why you never promise anything to children. Because as much as you say, they will remember. I swear by Allah. And at bedtime, they're like the IRS. They will go over and they will audit every statement you made. And they will remind you about how much of a liar you are. And that's where you tell them, inshallah, is if Allah wills, Habibi, not if I will. Right? No. But my point is, when you're a child, you can't deal with disappointment. Like, if I told Musa, we're going to get french fries, you know, on the way home, and I don't get french fries on the way home, he'll eat dinner and play and hang out. And then at bedtime, he's like, by the way, you never got me french fries. As if to be like, I didn't forget. Right? And that's the nature of being a child, is you don't have hilm. That's why when Allah described Ismail as what? Ghulam and Halim. This is an abnormal child. He can deal with things. Ibrahim's like, I have to slaughter you. He's like, that's fine. My kid's like, I wanted fries. You know? Ismail's like, I got to die. Like, you know, like there's just, subhan you can't even. <laughs> but as you get older, subhanAllah, your hilm is supposed to increase. Now, what makes your hilm increase? This is tying it all together. Okay, stay with me, everybody. We're entering turbulence. Buckle your seatbelts. Stay with me. What makes you able to develop more helm is when your ability to tolerate the wrongs that happen to you goes up. That function line, whether it's functional or dysfunctional, forgiveness, the dysfunctional threshold goes down. Not everything is dysfunctional anymore. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu people would go up to him and grab his shirt in front of his friends. In front of his family, they would shake him. One time a, a person came and grabbed him from the, the, the shirt so hard that they said it left a cut on his neck. This is the messenger of Allah. This is the leader of the Muslims. And Omar grabbed his sword ready. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, no, 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 hold on. Go and get him what he's asking for. Get him some grain. It's fine. He wants some grain. Give him some charity, man. He didn't even say like, bro, next time don't grab. You horse collared me, man. He didn't say that. Why? Because his hilm was like all the way up here. So, to forgive somebody, you have to be halim. If you have trouble forgiving, then you need to work on your hilm. And if you really feel like despite all of your hilm, that forgiveness is not an option, then in that scenario, in that moment, in that time, you might be in the state where you can take your right back. And that's nothing to feel bad for. So, when we look at the situation right now in Gaza, and we see the 20,000 plus people who were killed, most likely, right, official numbers are under that, but if you think about all of the people that are unaccounted for, when you see the lives that have been altered, irreparably, when you see the limbs that have been severed, when you see the lives that have been destroyed. Is this functional or dysfunctional? It's dysfunctional. And that's why you see when the Prophet ﷺ engaged with stuff like this in his life, when people came and tried to kill him or assassinate him or destroy Medina or kill the Muslims, that was not a moment for forgiveness. He was not like, oh yeah, everyone's fine. Come on in. You tried to kill me? Come over for breakfast. That wasn't how he responded. Because why? In your wrong, you tried to take my life? That would have rippled all of this dysfunctionally? Now we're enemies. So there is, Islam is so beautiful. Because the default is forgive. But there is a line. There is a line. And Allah and His Messenger did not expect you or I to put that line 
where it didn't belong. You forgive when you can. And your default is to forgive in your family, in your friends, in your dealings with people. Forgive, forgive, forgive. But if somebody does or says something to you that absolutely dislodges your spirit or your mind or your body, you're allowed to defend yourself and take the legal means uh, 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 of action to defend yourself. Someone at work says something about you, you're allowed to go to HR. And you know what's interesting, subhanAllah? Even in that haqq, you're actually a mercy for others. Because if you don't do that, if you don't, subhanAllah, this happened the other day. Somebody was like, you know, there's uh, people that are going around cursing Muslims, saying this, like, I'll kill Muslims, blah, blah, blah. And then you post it up and you're like, cancel this fool. Let's do it. Get, it, get this guy fired. You always have that one Muslim that's like, should we really be doing this? Would the Prophet have done this? I'm like, we need to read the seerah together. <laughs> because there are times, there are times when the Prophet him would have forgiven, but he forgives when a person wants forgiveness. But this guy is chanting Islamophobic rhetoric. This guy is doxing people, putting their addresses online. This guy, people are literally being harassed, stalked, physically. A six-year-old was killed. A, a, a college student was shot and paralyzed. We're allowed to have a line. We are allowed. Allah tells us to have a line. And in those moments, it is our responsibility to defend ourselves. And remember, if you turn the other cheek and let these monsters go, they will do it to somebody else too. And so that is why the haq that you're protecting is also the haq of everybody else. The Prophet ﷺ was not just trying to protect himself. He's trying to protect everybody. When you stop a bully... You also save everyone else that would have been bullied. When you stop a criminal, you save everyone else that would have been hurt. And so for us, forgiveness is our ethic. We are forgiving people. Allah tells us, forgive, 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 forgive. You will be forgiven. Always forgive. Forgive everybody. But then we are told that if it crosses the line, then seek justice. Inna Allah yuhibbul muqsiteen. Allah Ta'ala loves those who seek justice with justice, right? May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to forgive. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to get his forgiveness by forgiving others. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to always have uh, 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 forgiveness in our heart for those around us and for those that are near us and for those that see us and for those that interact with us. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to forgive. May Allah allow others to forgive us. May Allah make forgiveness easy for us. May Allah give us hilm, a strong forbearance when we are wronged. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to forbear and to withstand any of the wrongs that we experience. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to stand up for justice when it's, when it's our right. May Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to stand up for justice when we are called to it. May Allah Ta'ala uplift the oppression from our brothers and sisters in Palestine. May Allah Ta'ala save them. May Allah Ta'ala give them their right. May Allah Ta'ala give their martyr Jannah. May Allah Ta'ala give those who have been uh, uh, injured, those who have had their lives changed. May Allah Ta'ala give them a sakina that we know nothing about, that we have never experienced. May Allah Ta'ala give them all companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu in Jannah. May Allah Ta'ala give them their rightful home back. May Allah Ta'ala return all the Palestinians to their homes, Ya Rab. May Allah Ta'ala give every Muslim a chance to pray in Al-Aqsa with no barrier, with no, no, no gatekeeping. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to enter Al-Aqsa and to worship Him in the third holiest mosque in our religion. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahimeen. Oh Allah, we ask you, we are gathered here tonight, Ya Allah, as humble servants who have no power, nothing. Allah, our greatest action is to boycott, is to do nothing, Ya Allah. We ask you, to accept our du'as and to hear our pleas and to allow us and our du'as to be accepted so that our brothers and sisters across the world, whether it be in Palestine and Gaza or Sudan or Somalia or the Congo or Afghanistan or in Bangladesh or in Burma or the Uyghurs in China, Ya Allah, anywhere in the world where Muslims are oppressed, where the ummah of your Prophet Sallallahu is oppressed, O oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, by your names and attributes, O oh Allah, our hearts are filled with sins, Ya Allah. And we are so distant from you, Ya Allah. But O oh Allah, we are not calling upon you by ourselves. We're calling upon you by you, Ya Allah. We're seeking from you, Ya Allah, to give them their right and their justice and their safety and to uplift the oppression from them. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallillahum ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi tazim al kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. Um, I do have one thing that I want to show everybody. Sorry, real quick. Uh, next week for heart work. We don't normally do this, but I have, uh, we've invited a special guest, uh, inshallah, and some of you may or may not uh, know who he is, 
you may have seen some of his stuff on the internet. Can everybody? My name is